I'd like to thank the organizers for this excellent uh, conference. Uh, I'm glad we are able to use uh, internet, internet capabilities and maybe next year we won't have to get uh, together in the offline setting and we'll, it will be enough to turn on our computers and we'll be communicating. And uh, I, I'd like to say that this conference is very well organized and I'd like to thank uh, everyone for inviting me to this highly efficient and informative uh, conference. We uh, had uh, really useful lectures and presentations from real uh, outstanding scientists and researchers and uh, it will be just as great in the future and let me start my workshop by introducing its title to use simple words it's uh, using neural feedback if you have any questions about my slides uh, use uh, uh, your chat or uh, our Q&A link here or you can ask your questions in both Russian and English and you can also turn on your mic and ask a question directly. I'm from the city of Novosibirsk so far our city has been mentioned only once even though Academy member Kirchhoff, uh, one of the founders of internet, uh, is uh, from Novosibirsk. Uh, uh, Miss Dr. Guger uh, did mention that uh, we will have this hackathon in Novosibirsk uh, tomorrow. Most of our IT uh, experts uh, graduated the same Novosibirsk uh, State University. I'm an expert in physiology by my background. I'm going to talk about physiological and neuro, uh, physiological aspects of uh, neural control or BCI. There are many synonyms uh, meaning the same thing. Neural feedback is to change different functions, but BCI is how you control uh, those functions. Uh, I represent this uh, specific institute, which is uh, called State Research Institute of Physiology and Fundamental Medicine, one of the leading uh, institutions like that, and not just in the country, but all over the world. We study that uh, gap in uh, psychology. It's not so much uh, cognitive, uh, psychology, but it's more about emotions and uh, psychological well-being. We uh, look at the problems of depression, and I heard uh, one of the presentations yesterday, and there were questions about 2030, uh, when uh, depression will be the most uh, common disease of the century and Novosibirsk is actually the only city in Russia which is part of this Enigma uh, project. Again, the official title of my presentation is shown in the slide. Uh, um, and I'm not really talking about requirements but more of uh, factors that impact the efficiency of uh, BCI and neural control and neural feedback. And based on these uh, publications, a consensus was reached on how you're supposed to report the results and publish your articles and it contains recommendations to increase your efficiency because the efficiency of your neurofeedback is uh, hardly reaching 70% uh, in only uh, some types of this feedback, you get 100% efficiency, but it's basically MEG biocontrol. It's not neurofeedback per se. The main goal here is to focus on the unique aspects of a neurofeedback to get to this consensus. And what we really need to pay attention to 
and I like to uh, recommend certain designs and requirements for your feedback that would eventually improve the efficiency of your outcomes. This is the uh, overall uh, design offered in that article that I co-authored with uh, Drs. Lebedev and Asachi. Um, it, it, there's a total of 52 co-authors of that article. Uh, so we did play our, our small role in uh, putting it together. And these are the factors of the total effect of uh, BCI. Except for one word, voluntary, all these uh, maps are similar. This is something, uh, the, there are specific, non-specific uh, uh, factors for neurofeedback. And here you need a reference group. You have uh, general non-specific factors, those that have to do with repetition and natural factors. What do we mean by natural here? These are the factors that originally, in the natural way, impact the efficiency of our neurofeedback. And I'm going to be focusing mostly on these uh, factors, personal features, and our EEG uh, patterns. It's obvious that any impact can be assessed uh, whether they happened or not. When we have a pre-registration of a certain status that uh, that you have before your neurofeedback, NFT stands for neurofeedback training. When you register the initial and the end status of your process, that's uh, obviously necessary. There's an uh, overview of uh, Kadash from London devoted to the so-called medium predictors or moderate predictors of, of NFT success. And of course, it's like everywhere, it's attention, motivation, and your mood. Even though the same Dr. Kadosh says that some participants never learn to control their brain. And I would of course argue with that, but it's well known, almost all psychological features are reflected in a number of uh, physiological properties. And sometimes your physiological properties, since I'm a physiology expert, are the foundation of some of our psychological uh, traits. And this is how biocontrol is organized using these um, voluntary modifications of those physiological properties. Let me uh, speak in greater details about alpha neurofeedback. And here is one of the properties that can be successfully trained. This is so-called individual uh, EEG power in the alpha band. When I talk about endo phenotype, it, it is something related to genes and something that impacts our behavior in the final analysis. Our lab used to be called Cognitive Efficient Translational Neuroscience. The, this is the individual frequency of your alpha peak, it gives you the value which is, uh, can be determined genetically, the reduction of the uh, frequency, uh, you get the decrease in tension, and then you get the increase of uh, the power in such states as negative emotions, tension, trance, and you get the increase of the uh, frequency when it moves to the right, it's linked with motivation, positive emotions, and self-control. And there's this special uh, training type SMR training, which was mentioned by some of the previous speakers. Uh, why do I say that your individual alpha peak uh, 
uh, purity can be called uh, phenotype. You, in thalamic neurons, you generate alpha waves that are unique compared to, to all other neurons because the uh, purity of uh, currents there is self-regulating. That's why they're called peacemakers and their composition is based on building neural ensembles or uh, cores and would uh, give us the frequency that would be dominating in the EEG and also in our brain. This is the feedback control mechanism and it was uh, noted by Konstantin Anokhin yesterday that there is this Russian idea that would, would be promoting our Russian neuroscience and would give us some uh, push forward. And this feedback idea uh, originated in the research institute uh, named after Dr. Anokhin and, and Mikhail Ivanov also mentioned the same. When we have this thalamic neurons, they consist of two membranes. And there's this feedback mechanism allowing us to control this calcium uh, current in some of the calcium channels. That's why we have this uh, specific oscillations uh, but alpha uh, waves uh, is not the main topic of my presentation, uh, but how could they check that it was genetically determined? They took some uh, mice with uh, modified DNA. Uh, you get DNA from one mice, and it was uh, embedded into the pronucleus of a male. Uh, organism and you get a new DNA with new genes and this gene engineering uh, works so that got their authors the Nobel Prize uh, uh, first started by Academy member Nor. So basically this is been a modification when we use Scissors uh, to cut out a piece of the DNA, then to introduce a new piece of the DNA into a new organism to see what's going to happen. And as you can see on the right, there is a monument uh, to an experimental mouse in Novosibirsk, and the mouse is knitting recombinant DNA. So let's go back to our electric oscillations. It turned out that if we remove one subunit in these calcium channels, then The refraction, which used to be 100 milliseconds, will disappear and uh, a mouse will die from overexcitation. So the frequency of alpha, peak, of alpha peaks depends on metabolic processes, but it is also a structural, genetically determined characteristic, uh, uh, which is intrinsically a part of the uh, and uh, of in the time and you know when we use calcium channel medicines we can even treat alzheimer of course not a hundred percent but again we can do that so the more active calcium channels are the higher is uh, the frequency of the current the more spindles we get and so uh, we get more bursting and so we will have a shorter refractory period and therefore we will have the higher frequency of alpha peaks so people can be split into two large groups when it comes to our uh, to their alpha peak frequencies and when we do that we can see that people who demonstrate lower alpha peak frequency will also have will also be less successful academically and if the alpha peak frequency higher they will achieve more in academia 
This is the research that was carried out before, back in 1994. The research has shown that nonverbal creativity, let's say in people with all low alpha peak frequency, will use a different uh, strategy, they will perform tasks slower, and so on. So again, cognitive strategies and um, the speed of uh, thinking are directly correlated with alpha peak frequency. And we can see that subjects with different alpha peak frequency in while well, resting were also different when it came to musical training. Again, higher alpha peak frequency demonstrated faster learning abilities. But when it comes to self-reliance, then we can see that it is higher in people with low alpha peak frequency. So the cognitive abilities increase with age, but after 40 years of age, it starts decreasing in men. A lot of this is, of course, related to a hormonal scale. When progesterone is high, you now when progesterone levels are on the rise and the estrogen is on the rise, so then we also know the rise in the alpha peak frequency. So the higher is the estrogen level, the lower is the alpha peak frequency. The and if you look at women as compared to men, so the alpha peak frequency is lower in women at certain phases, therefore the IQ will be lower because it is directly related to estrogen levels. But if you look at the lutein phase, then the alpha peak frequency increases and therefore the IQ goes up as well. So it is a bit of a funny correlation, but it still remains a fact. The alpha peak frequency determines how teachable someone is, also determines somebody's learning ability. Therefore, this is sham biofeedback. And sham biofeedback shows us that if you do not have feedback, then the efficiency of training goes up compared to two different phases so during menstrual phase, premenstrual phase, the efficiency is at the lowest, and during the lutein phase, the efficiency is at the highest. But if we look at the effectiveness of biofeedback training, then of course it will also vary depending on the hormonal state. So we tried to start the training during the effective hormonal phase. And then again, we see that the effectiveness goes down in the placebo control group and it remains low in the menstrual and premenstrual phase. But women who started receiving training during the luteal phase using a bio feedback, the effectiveness goes low, goes down initially and then it starts increasing again. So the alpha peak frequency is a predictor of um, learning aptitude, but it is also a predictor of uh, psychiatric conditions. So here we look at uh, neurogenic pain, and as you can see, alpha peak frequency is decreased. But the amplitude of alpha waves is on the rise when compared is on the rise when compared to healthy population. So if we administer training to children with ADHD, then the frequency of our individual alpha peaks will be lower compared to a healthy cohort. And again, if we look at individual frequency in standard uh, ranges, then again we would encounter quite a lot of difficulties. If we have low alpha peak frequency, let's say nine, then beta will start at 11 Hertz. But if we have high alpha peak frequency, then we will see beta waves at 13 uh, Hertz. And theta 
depending on uh, the uh, width of the range, will also shift to the right. So if we do not account for this frequency, then it would lead to a, a certain effect which had been discovered by uh, Berger. So what is an alpha rhythm according to Berger? Well, he says uh, that... He said that the highest amplitudes of posterior regions in waves uh, with a frequency of either 8 or 12 uh, hertz range will be higher. So basically the spindle-like oscillations in electric potential will show us a large peak when performing an open eyes test. So if the waves change in alpha one range, then we witness certain psychological effects. But if it happens in the alpha two range, then that will be something related to training and consciousness. So here on the left, we will have some drug induced um, effects or maybe hypnosis induced effects. And on the right, we will have uh, cognitive activation, let's say after a music lesson. So if we look at it a bit closer, and if we try to analyze, uh, let's say, children with ADHD using this methodology, then we will see that they have quite a wide alpha range, which is also quite lower compared to their theta. But here on the bottom, we see that also uh, becomes a larger range when it is lower. So in Novosibirsk, we've been making a software which allows us to administer theta beta training. So we are trying to decrease theta waves and increase beta waves. We do these training sessions with children. So if we decrease theta wage, we go down to four to eight hertz. Uh, but what does it mean uh, going down from four to eight hertz? We are not just going to decrease individual alpha peak frequency, but we will force a decrease in alpha peak frequency and we will create forced tension conditions. Later, David Kaiser wrote about it in back, well, 10 years back. Basically, we will create a worsening of conditions and not an improvement. So basically, all of the characteristics will suffer. The alpha peak frequency will go down, the width of the range will go down, And if you look at all of the standard ranges, so what I'm trying to say here is that if you look at the standard ranges, we have to think really long and hard before we provide a biofeedback. So once we have adjusted it in, uh, for this boy, and once we used individual ranges, you see that everything happened the way it was supposed to. And so the, uh, we managed to produce uh, wider ranges, higher peaks, and so on. What else can be done? As you look at this, these are so-called ergonomic issues or general non-specific issues. What are these issues? So there are compression or contact stress, awkward postures, forceful exertions, insufficient rest breaks. So you see the list of these factors on the screen and let me um, go into them one by one. So let's uh, talk about compression or contact stress or forceful exertions. What is uh, excessive uh, stress? Well, we'll say a musician is nervous before the performance. What happens? A person would clench their fist. So the minute the fists are clenched, 
a person won't be able to control finer finger movements. So the alpha peaks will go down and a person will become very anxious about their performance. This is a fact that is widely, widely known. So the amplitude of the alpha waves decreases when MG muscle tone of the scalp increases. So uh, scalp EMG measurement itself could reflect the muscle activity involved in psychomotional tension or mental stress. So if we control the frontal lobe activity, we will be able to decrease uh, psychological and emotional tension. There are even um, certain training sessions that address tension, headaches, and... Uh, they decrease excessive muscle tension. Again, here you have uh, high tonicity, and high tonicity means low alpha waves and increased EMG readings. Well, it turned out that EMG reading was obtained from the areas that are responsible for cognitive abilities, F1P, F2P, and F3 and then uh, F4 pl placed on the forehead. So this is the area of uh, the mimetic muscles of the forehead. And it turned out that it was coherent to the muscles which tense up during stress. And it is also a coherence with the muscles of the forearm which move the finger. But what's even more interesting is that is also here in two ranges below 10 hertz and over 10 hertz. And that is something that I used to be very skeptical about, especially if we look at beta results or if we consider beta training. So if I talk about our children with ADHD, it shows us that if uh, people, if our kids strain their uh, forehead, they increase beta waves and they get the uh, biofeedback. Well, do you think this training would be effective? Well, to put it in other words, um, alpha EG registered every 100 uh, milliseconds you is directly shows inverse proportion to the EMG reading, both on the forehead and in the forearm. To put it differently, if we want to train alpha waves, we need to disregard the locations which also train EMG. Usually we look at uh, raw EMG or integral EMG, according to Mrs. Asache and Lebedev. So what do we do in this regard? We set a certain mean threshold, which is usually equal to the mean alpha wave power. And we also set a certain EMG threshold for the forehead. Then during a training session, we register alpha peaks above or below the thresholds. And if it is above the thresholds, uh, a sound alarm or a feedback alarm, hmm comes online and once both thresholds exceeded, like I said, the sound feedback occurs, but if EMG goes up, the sound feedback does not occur. And only when both thresholds are exceeded, then the sound feedback occurs. So it turned out that when we do these uh, a training session that increases alpha but decreases EMG. We have, uh, we play the sound of applause for musicians and we compare it to the group of uh, also biofeedback. And that means that we can quantify these successful periods. It turned out that the low frequency bands, you see the white columns on the screen, they are less effective during the first uh, bio control session, um, especially when compared to high frequency bands. But if uh, we do bio control with some um, 
feedback, then you see that nothing changes here. But on the right, you can see that the low frequency bands increase their uh, efficiency in direct proportion to the number of training sessions performed. So what it tells us is that uh, different EEG factors uh, should be accounted for or taken into account rather before the training. And so uh, we need to correlate them with the frequency of alpha peaks. For those people with a low frequency, uh, self-control or voluntary control training sessions are especially needed. But people with uh, higher peak frequencies, these uh, training could also be useful for them, but they don't really need more than five to seven training sessions. What I'm trying to say is that we always need to be aware of the initial neurophysiological status. So 70% of children with ADHD have increased muscle tension in their forehead, so they have uh, no control over their forehead muscles. When we compare it to different groups of children, some of them received standard pro uh, training protocol, some of them received individual uh, training protocol, and the third group uh, received individual training a protocol for theta, beta, but also... Um, EMG readings, and the fourth group was uh, control group. So we looked pre-test, during test, a six months post-test. And it turned out that you see the red line. The red line is uh, parallel by model control that increases uh, theta and beta, and you can see that the reaction time goes down it can only be compared to individual biocontrol. But if you look at individual biocontrol and we see that it can bounce back, well, at least partially. But those children who receive training together with cell training, their control, together with training their forehead muscles, so they show the same reaction time as... Um, they had after biocontrol. The same is true about withheld reward. Uh, you remember the famous marshmallow test and uh, children who are able to control their impulse and not take a second candy. Well, we see that their impulse control improved, especially compared so, to the groups with standard biocontrol and mock biocontrol. So what I'm trying to say here is that we have to take into account low amplitude EMG waves when we are talking about biocontrol and brain-computer interface, especially if we're trying to create patterns using scalp EEG readings. Well, cortical EEG readings are quite different in this regard. Yesterday, I was listening to Professor Zasachi and Lebedev. They were talking about inserting a small plate to acquire uh, ECOG readings. It was very interesting when they said that they were also registering the gamma waves. In, in other words, this low amplitude and low frequency uh, manifestations that are even cut uh, in the analysis, they reflect the psycho-emotional tension level. And basically, we need to consider them at all times. When we uh, do the EEG training, we have to consider them to control them, not just uh, to cut the major artifacts, uh, but these really mean uh, low amplitude artifacts that are the expressions of tonic tension of the muscles. As for the posture control, there are a number of uh, articles in, even under the Soviet Union, started by Kozlovska. If we uh, bring our body weight onto the front of the feet, we increase alpha to power. These are uh, really interesting articles. We got the confirmation with two groups of uh, 
aged uh, women. Uh, they needed to train their balance. They used fitness, uh, non-specific exercises, and uh, the other group was using Aikido. When you move the body weight onto the front of their feet and the alpha would increase, only alpha got up only with women who were trained in Aikido and the EMG went down for them. And then in the other group, Alpha was going down when they got up and the atomic uh, tension would go up. In other words, these women, uh, for these women, it's easier to stand and keep their balance. Recently, we got some uh, fresh data that if you train this balance uh, using the specific exercises, the frequency of alpha uh, went up only with those people who were successful during that training, who got more points than those who were unsuccessful. The red line is for uh, the unsuccessful people. I am not showing you the uh, average because I didn't have that many subjects, but you can see when they were unsuccessful, the frequency of alpha peak goes down and when they were successful in training of postural control, the uh, frequency goes up. In other words, uh, it's better for human for humans when they get uh, effective during training. Uh, should eyes be open or closed? Uh, in most, this uh, there are many different opinions here. Uh, mostly, they do training uh, with open eyes. But what do we mean by open eyes? It's the so-called Berger effect, uh, neuron neuronal activation, non-specific neuronal activation, we immediately turn it on as a distracting factor when we train some EEG value with open eyes. Berger has shown that uh, with closed eyes, the amplitude of some waves uh, that he called alpha goes down when you open your eyes and then it goes up again as soon as you shut your eyes and you get the time marks of 100 milliseconds at the bottom. It not only goes down, but when you open your eyes, if you imagine opening your eyes, which is actually the basis of, of our entire ideology of BCI and your feedback, when you imagine opening your eyes, you are almost doing it. But but kids with attention deficit uh, have poor imagination in that sense. And when uh, you we talk about closed or open eyes, I uh, looked through a lot of articles and I found out that that Camille is uh, the founder of Alpha Stimulating Biocontrol is is against or was against open eyes. And if we train alpha increase, we train the decrease of activation. Maybe in some cases it's helpful, but in most cases, this is anti-natural. Uh, the, there's another economic issue, is the presence of uh, breaks between sessions. We used to make this mistake, uh, 20 minutes of uh, uh, neural control session the person goes to sleep, wakes up in that amount of time, and but David Vernon and uh, his team suggested to run them no longer than three minutes or even two minutes. Immediately, as soon as you get uh, feedback, and then you ask this person, how did this person reach it? What? they were thinking about during that short break. And it turned out that if we, as we move on to non-specific factors, if we give instructions, don't think about anything, it, we end up in a deadlock. Try to think about nothing right now. First of all, you will have this idea in your head. Don't think about anything. Don't think about anything. But, but, but there are other... Uh, Techniques here, for example, imagine something nice or pleasant. This is what we usually ask our uh, subjects. But still, uh, point number one is postural control. You move your weight 
to the front of your, of your feet. And this is a poorly uh, studied area, and this is what we have in our uh, training sessions to try to understand how it's connected with the brain mechanism. Of course, breathing control is also here. We all remember very well how you, uh, when you deliver babies, you give this advice to women uh, to have this extended expiration and abdominal breathing. And in a non-specific way, it in increases the alpha-2 power. But it doesn't matter much for training. Most importantly is for the person to know that in this state of increased alpha-2 power, they will only get it if they move their weight to the front of their sole or feet or to uh, follow a certain breathing technique uh, or trying to reduce uh, frontal forehead uh, muscle tension and so on. And then we asked our subjects to uh, we asked them what kind of strategy they used during training. And in 60% of cases, they used imagining nice things. You can understand them. It's easy. You go into the chair and imagine you are with a, a plate of soup or bowl of soup or you're doing things. Some of them used breathing. A few used uh, relaxation of forehead muscles and, and only a few moved their body weight to the uh, front of their uh, soles. And, but the most efficient one turned out to be the postural one. The number two in terms of efficiency was breathing, and the least efficient was our imagination. Of course, when we imagine something, uh, when, because when we imagine, um, skiing or mounting skiing uh, immediately after that you imagine that you fall and it spoils everything we talk about not just biofeedback you talk about operant conditioning or biofeedback but in biofeedback we have this subject uh, student get trained to voluntarily change their functions using or positive strengthening. They are not punished by uh, high current for doing something wrong. In operant conditioning, it's involuntary. So they use both carrots and sticks. And here we get a mouse that would be pressing the liver for food. And in this case, you get a human being who knows how to get his state of optimal functioning, the so-called learners. Here you get manipulation and bad marks, and here you have training and self-regulation. And this is the most important part, how we are different, how biofeedback is different from operant conditioning BCI, cannot be used as uh, something to train uh, voluntary uh, abilities. Everything is involuntary there. And signal processing is the favorite topic of uh, today's uh, conference. And so, but I'll be brief here. The higher discretization, the quicker you're going to be with your feedback signal. And if uh, naturally, this it takes the signal a long time to change. For example, there's uh, CO2 concentration or our, our interval uh, with a list of uh, what kind of tachycardia you need to have of how many milliseconds. You need to use those signals for the training that uh, uh, are delivered immediately for your successful biocontrol 
you need to be able to change it. We chose EEG, AMG, and st uh, stability-metric uh, parameters, but how quickly a human being needs to be able to receive that signal. I'm, I really enjoyed this uh, uh, article by Lib Defender Sachi from High School of Economics, who showed where the latency is minimum, the efficiency goes up much uh, better than an FB mock. And of course, you need to also mention those thresholds that are not considered in some protocols at all. It just says you need to increase it compared with the previous signal. It goes up, and here's your feedback. Uh, not to mention considering it with EMG, but there's a certain uh, threshold. The human being came to you with this particular state, and their threshold is from 15 to 19, and the next day they come and with very low uh, threshold and to uh, build your training program according to the same factors would be wrong. You need to set it before every session. But what should you choose? The average value or below the average or above the average? 100%, 130% or 70%? And when we compared low and high, uh, low and high IIPFs uh, with low frequency, it's uh, more convenient when it's lower than the average because they need to learn. But for high frequencies, they always have the efficiency uh, in the beginning. In the beginning, it was higher than for low frequencies. And, and uh, we talk about the follow-up group a month after the sessions. There's this variable threshold. The first part of the session of uh, six periods, you run the first period with low threshold, then we increase it, then it goes to the average, and then to 130%. And that would be the most efficient approach. The montage is uh, ama an amazing uh, thing. Some choose bipolar montage. And the amplitude would be lower here than with referential montage or monopolar montage. And I used to like this American picture. Frequency of waves or so amplitude would, of course, be lower than in this top case. But technically, it's more convenient to use monopolar montage like this on the left side than to. Uh, Electrodes for alpha bio control, it doesn't matter whether you have your reference. But for other low frequency bands, it turns out that it loads depending on the location. We need to understand that very well. This is not MEG low frequency artifacts, not the tonic tension of uh, scalp. Uh, muscles it, it can be in the front uh, in the uh, parietal or occipital areas and so on and you should always remember the fact the focus is always in the back and what about the topology where do you put this to the left to the right it but no matter where you put your electrode if you train alpha increase then after the training even if you get your f Three electrode, you will get increase of up, up, uh, amplitude in uh, P4. So take it easy on the one hand, and you need to remember that we are training not a specific area of uh, the brain or scalp, but we train a function, a function that largely depends on the frequency, not on the amplitude. The, the amplitude is a situational state, frequency is a personal state. Uh, at this, I would like to uh, bring my presentation to, the, to a close.